so thank you. Uh, welcome back. Welcome to the second part of this day-long celebration of Pierre's uh, life and work and trajectory. It is my honor and privilege to, uh, uh, to host this uh, conversation with Pierre. Uh, and in keeping with uh, the um, uh, techno-poetic and its critique, I'll begin with a few uh, smartphone notes. I was trying to remember uh, how I came to know uh, Pierre and his work. Uh, in 2004, uh, I'm a lowly graduate student at my first real conference, a very uh, uh, intimidating but impressive conference called Di Diasporic Avant-Garde at UC Irvine. Uh, and Pierre is presenting a talk, I believe, on the nomadic circulation of contemporary poetics between North America, Europe, and the Maghreb, right? Uh, and there's all these US uh, uh, poets and scholars, right, thinking about uh, diaspora, diaspora, how do we pronounce it, what does it mean, right? Uh, and Pierre gives this talk, and it became clear to me that what was happening in that talk was a, a subversive resituating of what poetry could mean across and along these, uh, these geopolitical but also existential contexts. So in typical Joris fashion, Pierre was using a kind of institutional event framed around diaspora and avant-garde, these very two loaded terms, uh, to make us rethink what those uh, terms could be. And in sort of a whole other series of terms and spatialities and geographies, right? So, uh, uh, so it, it, as it were, that was my first engagement with a nomad poetics in action, right? A poetics that uh, inserts itself right into a particular uh, space and time, and then it helps us rethink uh, its, uh, its potentialities. Uh, so I should say I'm a Puerto Rican poet, so when I think of the nomad, I think of the deterritorialized in the context of colonialism and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, maybe uh, ugly stuff, but I think Pierre's work has helped me see the nomad as also an existential alternative and a political opportunity, right? So the nomad as a kind of critical space, and a space that unlike uh, uh, boring academic theory, one might actually enjoy inhabiting uh, for a little while, right? Uh, and then, of course, I jump forward to 2008, and I begin my, my position here at UAlbany. Uh, and, it's, and then this, somehow this uh, provisional yet beautiful space uh, opens up right into Pierre's generosity towards me, a word mentioned often during the panel uh, but the, when I, what I, that I can also attest to, right? So I come in with my kind of spoken word formalism. And I'm, I'm Pierre must have been thinking, who is this guy, right? Uh, but once I arrive, the dinner parties, right, the reading suggestions, right, the, uh, uh, the feedback on my manuscripts, right, I think Pierre became to me a model of what poetry and community uh, can be. I mean, this wasn't the uh, MFA polished poet, this wasn't the street posturing slam poet, this wasn't the programmatic experimentalist poet, but a kind of field of poetic and political possibilities. And I remember one, one time when Pierre had a very busy week and he was heading up to Buffalo, I believe to do a reading for a former student, Christina Miletti probably, mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking, wow, from what Pierre told me, told me the honorarium isn't much, the trek is pretty long, why is Pierre doing this? It's not adding a lot to his CV, right? And he's told me something to the effect of, that's what I do, right? <laughs> this is how we roll, right, in Jorizian <laughs> hip hop speak, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is funny because I've just uh, been thinking about how many poets I knew on the New York scene who were too busy to do anything, even talk poetry, which, th which seemed to be the <laughs> ultimate, right, in sadness, right, that you're too busy as a poet to talk poetry. So I uh, thank you, Pierre, for uh, always making time, right? Uh, and I think of that time, just to conclude, in the context of, of maybe a poetics of relation, to think of Glissant, right, of, of whom Pierre is a great reader and a great reinterpreter, and who shares, right, an archipelic, uh, Deleuzian, right, uh, a worldview and a poet scholarly, right, mode, mode of engagement across and along uh, geographies and traditions. So that sense in Glissant of relation as relaying traditions, but also relinking histories and spaces. So looking back is always a way of rethinking what the future uh, could be. And also in a nod to kind of New York history, I think of Patti Smith, and uh, you gotta relate, babe. <laughs> you gotta find the rhythm within, right? Uh, so thank you, Pierre, for letting me find the rhythm within. Uh, and on that note, we'll begin our conversation. Um, so I, I guess, uh, it, it, because it's something that connects to my own experience, and because you mentioned it, in the Albany Times Union in interview that I hope everybody saw, uh, could you speak to the experience of growing up uh, multilingual, right? And, and uh, either biographically or as it uh, shaped your poetics? 
I basically meant that speaking with forked tongues comes natural to you. <laughs> right? And you immediately kind of beyond any uh, problematics thereof. Uh, you, you, know, you know that you have a language that you speak with. Uh, my mama Lushen being a Luxembourgish, I spoke at home and I spoke in the street. But all the, my reading I learned in German and in French consecutively, Robert actually staggered it way more out than it was. It was actually German and French at the same time. Uh, while Luxembourg is being spoken and then in high school Spanish and Latin and English came to it, right? Uh, so you were immediately immersed in a world where um, you know that there were many languages. And I think the core, realizing later on, the way I could explain it, what it did most profoundly, was to explain to me that any single explanation of the world has to be untrue. Because I know that you can explain it differently in a different language because languages have a different way of sticking to the world. So that there is no one explanation, right? So that any uh, way of looking at the world like that is wrong, which is why I was very happy when in America I found Robert Duncan's term, the multiverse. We're not in a universe, you know, that turns around one thing. We're in a multiverse. And to me, that richness is, of course, incredible. Um, on a more pragmatic uh, uh, terrain, having the many languages um, is also a way of getting the poems written uh, quicker and faster because I can draw on the different ones. Ted Berrigan once told me that it is very important to ha know all the dirty little tricks to write poetry with. And my favorite one of those little tricks, you know, is exactly that when I'm stopped somewhere in a poem, I can retranslate that last image or phrase into one of my other languages, and that means a very odd thing very often. It doesn't make sense in that language, right? It gives it a certain swerve, you know. I mean, we could go to that, that the notion of, you know, there's a book called The Swerve, right, recently, and it's really uh, that whole concept of a philosophical tiny difference and out of that difference I can move on I can continue and the poem goes elsewhere which is where I want poems to go anyway <laughs> be elsewhere that's great uh, I mean that, that seems like a very uh, uh, organic way of thinking about uh, poetry it also seems very like and very unlike uh, the way folks were thinking about poetry maybe in the, in the 60s when you were when you were uh, uh, coming up uh, I wonder was that a sense that you had when you were first getting involved in poetry or did that uh, poetics right uh, 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 take time to evolve right in, in the context of your writing it took some time uh, being born in Luxembourg with the mother tongue being Luxembourgish and the cultural languages being German and French in that Luxembourg context, this is very, uh, how to say, socio-politically determined. People who didn't go to school very long knew more German. And so the working class was German speaking. The bourgeoisie insisted on speaking French because they were the higher class, right? And they knew that language. So immediately you were caught, you, you saw the country's layers, you know, how they lay. Uh, Luxembourg writers have to make a decision. At that time they had. Now it's easier because they actually stand up. After World War II, uh, they fed it enough that either the French or the Germans would run over them, so they decided to make Luxembourgish the national language and to uh, standardize the spelling, make a dictionary, so, to, so as to make, it a make one able to actually write it, write it. I never learned how to write it because you never learned it in school, right? So a Luxembourg writer until those years, until 68, let's say, when the dictionary came out, interesting moment, by the way, this is right around there that it happened. Uh, the Luxembourg writer, or the writer from Luxembourg, had to decide to write either in German or in French. And very often, it was a socially conscious writer would write in German because, you know, a class consciousness was there. And the more bourgeois, a feet bourgeois, uh, <laughs> would write in French. Um, I started writing in both languages because I had been turned on to poetry and turned on as a teeny word. It was really, uh, uh, I heard a Paul Celan poem at 15 in high school read and that turned me around completely, offering 
the possibility of poetry up as a way in which language works that uh, it's not the daily speech nor is it literature as such you know it was poetry and you know my hair stood on end it was really the only epiphany actual epiphany I can actually speak of that was in, in high school but on the same time German so I was reading up on all the, the current German literature poetry and novels and so on I'm from Luxembourg and in the 50s the problems of the Germans were certainly not the problems of Luxembourg, right? So it was not a domain in which culturally I had any, any, anything to say, really. <laughs> so I turned to French. And the French at that moment I found relatively uninteresting. They were doing a kind of late uh, surrealism, right? It was a kind of down period in, 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 French, in French poetry and poetics. There were a couple of the major ones like Henri Michaud was still writing and so on. But in a way, I wasn't profoundly interested in that language. It happened that at 16, running away from a symphony that our school took us to, it was Tchaikovsky, I went into a bookshop it was an erotic bookshop that only lasted three, two months, three months before the bishop closed it down. Luxembourg was run by the bishopric. Um, and I was looking for sexy books, you know, 16, da da. And so I bought two books, thinking they were really sexy. One was Allen Ginsberg Howell, and the, <laughs> other, and the other was William Burroughs' The Naked Lunch. <laughs> Duh, you know. So I got stuck. And a year later, my uncle took me, as always, to holidays in Spain on the beach, and there was this young English honeymoon couple, and they, they raced off the beach, clearly other things in mind, and forgot a book next to their beach gear. I, of course, went and picked it up, and there I had my copy of On the Road. So now I was completely established inside of this. And so I began thinking, why shouldn't I write in English? If I have to write in a foreign language, why do I have to write in my second or third one? Because well, the, the, the language and the culture that interested us was what was happening in America at that point. Jazz, I started by my first published piece of writing in the Young Catholic Students Organization in high school was a potted biography of Charlie Parker, right? I got my mother to drive me to Metz in France to listen to, to uh, Ray Charles. They had taken me at 12 to an uh, Armstrong Fitzgerald concert in Ostend, right? So there was that stuff in the ear. And I'd bicycle home from high school and listen to AFN radio stations. They had a rock concert at quarter past 12, where I could hear, at that point, Fats Domino, right? All of that material. And so that was the life culture. And so at one moment, when I was in Paris in medical school and dropped out, decided to be a poet, I had to make the choice which language to write in. And what seemed the live language and the interesting language was American, not even English. And at 18, one is foolish enough, one makes big, big jumps, right? And so I just said, okay, I'll do that. Go to America, become an American poet. Hmm. That's fascinating. I wonder, was there ever a, a, a tension between how you saw yourself and what you saw in these American poets. I'm thinking of my own experience as b being Puerto Rican and reading uh, maybe uh, Ginsburg and saying, wow, song of these states, right? The fall of America, that's Whitman, obviously. And that's about American expanse, but I come from this tiny island. I don't see myself in that American expanse, right? Or seeing Burroughs in Tangier, right? And seeing the kind of his complexly colonial relationship to those, to those spaces, right? So I'm wondering if there was that kind of pull, but also a kind of critical uh, c engagement, right, with, with that kind of poetry because you're coming from a very different place and thinking in transnational, right, or, or cross-cultural, yeah. multilingual terms. But see, Luxembourg, Puerto Rico is an empire in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> we are, as I usually say, the belly button of Europe or the lint therein. <laughs> I'm not certain which. So, you know, it was a relatively... Uh, no, so it was always trans, you know, moving across. It was always trans-border. In Luxembourg, they used to say, if you don't have bi uh, brakes on your bicycle, you better pack your passport, right? <laughs> because you were at a border very quickly, you know, 20 miles on each side, you were on a border. So you, you were continuously always into other cultures. And America was, of course, 
the uh, uh, the place with uh, most cultures in a, in a way you know where everybody came and that had at the same time that great thing uh, that I found extremely liberating from Europe and uh, that I found best encapsulated early on not so much in Kerouac's on the road was wonderfully romantic right but the way I realized that most was reading Olson when uh, Olson, in Olson's essay, he opens us by, by saying um, space, and I write space in capital letters because it comes large here. And that was the most liberating thing, the fact that the space of America, the geography, because Europe, to my mind, to my generation, post for two generation, in its sensibilities, was completely mired in 20th century was basically the history of two world wars that were totally unneeded, i.e. in millions of dead, blood-soaked soil sunk by all the national anthems, right? So history, nobody could drag themselves out of history. You know, you, you, you were sunk mid-rift into the muck of history. And America permitted one to begin to move around freely, to cross territory. So uh, it sounds like you were, uh, from the beginning, engaged in a kind of poetics of, of uh, translation, and I wonder if you could speak to that. I think one of the things I find so inspiring about your work is that uh, translation is not just a kind of discrete practice, right, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, about, the, about a, the production of a textual uh, corpus, but also about a system of relationships between texts and, and between languages. And, and you mentioned mm -hmm. working with Robert Kelly and, 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 and entering into that uh, uh, into, into those translation projects. But had you been thinking in terms of translation uh, beforehand, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, the yes. relationship between languages and so on. I, I mean, when I was in Paris and living in Shakespeare and Company, as was mentioned earlier, you know, my father had cut me off from when I dropped out of medical school. I thought I'd got to make a living somehow. And well, I have various languages. Let me start translating. There was a little magazine there called Two Cities that was run by uh, an, uh, an Antillian a Caribbean uh, psychiatrist who was a poet for some time. Two cities was England and Paris, London and pa Paris. So it was, uh, yeah. and he offered me first translations, and I translated some Ceylon for him in '66, but it never came out because the magazine then closed. You know, it, Jean Franchette was the man's name, a uh, poet uh, from Martinique, I, I believe. Uh, so translation in that sense was always a, an immense possibility there. And for example, when I came to the US in 67 to go to Bard, I thought, well, yeah, my dad gave me money again to go to college and the ticket to go to America. Maybe I don't want to go to college. Maybe I just want to be a beatnik and hit the road, you know? So what will I do then to make money? Well, I could translate. So I took the two books that I liked most in 67 in France and brought them with me. And I sat at Bard College in my dorm and thought, well, let me send, translate a chapter of each and send it to New York publishers, right? And maybe that will, they will pick it up and then I can become independent and translate and maybe go on the road. And I sent the chapters and never anything came back or two negatives. They were difficult books. It was Derrida's De la Grammatologie <laughs> and Michel Foucault's Le Mo Les, Les Mots et Les Choses. You know, and I had miscalculated my attempt here for early quick fame in the translating business. So, you know, translation was always there, was always, uh, uh, in a way, central. Later on, I came to think of it even more profoundly as uh, uh, that it is important to change, and I taught that for many years because I never liked teaching creative writing, but all, always liked to teach translation or writing through translation as it is the closest way to read a poem is to translate it. So it is also the best way of learning something about another, another piece of, uh, of writing. And I finally got, came to kind of the realization uh, that Robert Kelly also has in a, in a lovely sense and that is that language itself is translation. That is, you know, if you work something in language it comes out of physiological, uh, neurological sparks somehow, you know, it is translated from a, from an, an, a physical incarnation, from a bodily uh, notion into something that we call language, right? Uh, so 
all language is translation and therefore literary translation as such is only one aspect of the language game or of doing something with language and what was very important for me eventually was to uh, deconstruct the hierarchy of saying the original poem in the ori in a, that is the language and translation is just repetition in a lesser register is just bad imitation and so on. But to say no, a poem in fact is all the translations it can give rise to. A poem is not that one single canonical print thing, because even if you look at the poet's first drafts, and then the way the poem is published in a magazine first in the company of others, then in the first volume, in a given volume of poems, then in a selected, and then in a collected works. That poem is a different poem every time it is published because of its context. So it is a translation of itself on and on. In the oral too, the poet reading it, the poet then it being translated as a language. So that poem to me is the integral, if you want, of all its possible instantiation, which breaks down that, that hierarchy that, you know, uh, between translation and original poem. It's great, and kind of what Peter Middleton calls the long history of the poem, right? right. So the, the aggregate of every right. every instant instantiation of it. Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like, uh, 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 in a translation is firmly rooted to a kind of political, you know, uh, worldview, and I use the word political carefully, because I think I see kind of two dimensions of that in your work. One is about the politics of translation itself, thinking of just the, in our own local context of the monolingualism, right? The kind of uh, uh, puritanical monolingualism of so much, right? Of uh, you, the U.S. literary mainstream, right? And, but also the ways in which that uh, uh, monolingualism perhaps uh, reflects to or connects, right? Uh, a larger series of nationalisms, right? Or imperial histories. So I wonder if we could speak to that, uh, any potential connection between as it were, poetics and politics, well, right, between your view on language and, and, and your, your sense of... It's obviously totally directly there. If, if there is one language, or as the Texan says, the Bible was, of course, written in English, right? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, it cannot be a translation because it is the word of God. So, you know, dong dong, it sticks. So, I think what, what translation and multilingual existence teaches you is that language, I, our way of imagining and thinking the world and the world does not stick one to one to each other, right? Uh, that is that in different languages you're going to think and create a different world. And that to me is the most radical political statement you can make because then immediately you're in a realm of the multiverse, what I called earlier the multiverse, you know, of a place where the absolute certainty uh, this is the way things are or have to be is no longer there, you know, because you have to acknowledge that that other person in that other language uh, shares a world that is however different, right? And so that there has to be sharing in difference, right? And I think then immediately the uh, kind of mono-ideological construct becomes obsolete. So there I think very profoundly there's a political context. Okay. I mean, just thinking of the, the, the whole question of multiple iterations of a poem, I wonder if you could talk then about performance. I think it's maybe an aspect of your work that a lot of people don't think about, right? Uh, uh, but that I've, uh, you know, come to know and, and be inspired by, whether it's uh, your uh, performances with Nicole, right, or your, 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 uh, your, uh, uh, your recordings, right? Uh, the, uh, that sense it may be uh, poetry off the page, right, could be another instance of, of its movements, of its, of its shifts. Uh, and also the idea that maybe performance could be a critical category, not just a description, right, of, of a mode of embodied production. Uh, you know, uh, what Peter mentioned in his talk about, say, the ways in which Olson's breath, right, uh, uh, could, could connect to Salam's breath, right? So, so a kind of uh, uh, um, way of engaging, right, uh, the compositional, the performative, right, in, in a, in a, from the uh, point of view of a transnational field. So it seems that you could think of the performance at yet, yet, yet another di dimension, right, of your critically engaged poetics. Well, it came that wonderful way that the book I translated, that book that I brought over with me also and that I did translate, got my BA from, is called Atemwende, Paul Celan's book that I translated as Breath Turn. I, the change in his poetics, he, he, he in, incarnated in the word 
a change of breath, breath turn, you know, like the breath changes. And one of the other very important things for in America, but American poetry for me was the oral aspect, you know. In Europe, there were very l few poetry readings. Poetry, in the French sort of, the great poet was Malamé, and things were quiet on the page, right, with long silences between that didn't need to be actually spoken or said, you know. Uh, and I remember the incredible pleasure it was when you actually read a poem aloud, you know, in public. I mean, I, Shakespeare and Company again, which was really this, this crucible, there was uh, 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 poetry readings happening there. And I remember sitting around that weird little well that had a little gassing at the bottom where they could put a flame on or else there was coins just dropped in it and people, people would be reading. And I tentatively read there one night, there was a reading in, in honor of Langston Hughes. And so I wrote a little poem, little thing, for Langston Hughes, who I had only read two or three poems for, but I thought, you know, it would be very, and so I actually got to read it aloud. And it was, at one level, it was a totally great experience of, wow, yes, I can read in public. I got slammed down immediately <laughs> by Ted Jones, an uh, African-American poet that some of you will know, who talked, what is this honky bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> and so immediately, if you want, there was a political climate set by uh, the fact of speaking up loud I was saved, I will say, by Jimmy Baldwin, who told Ted Jones to shut up. <laughs> Let me be. So, woo, you know, that was also like, like being simply introduced into a world into which I could not have spoke, I would not have gone and said, Mr. Baldwin, can I speak to you, right? <laughs> uh, but the fact that this was an, an, a communal reading around this, this, this well in this bookshop, uh, it, it was being permitted to speak, you know. I'm permitted to come into the company and speak and dance in, you know, in, in there. And that to me again is that deeply political uh, uh, statement that um, the company is, you know, the field, the people that, that, that you're with. Right. I mean, uh, along those lines, I just love the idea of of uh, you know community in your work, and I wanted to ask you about collaborations. That's that's uh, uh, so it seems so important to you. Whether it's again uh, collaborating with performance artists or uh, the the anthology oh, as, right. as, yeah, as, yeah, as a collaborative right. practice, right? Uh, uh, it, it, it seems that um, we we tend to think of poetry and translation as solitary affairs, right? But in your work, there's this uh, decided move, right, to mm -hmm. not only collaborate but think strategically mm -hmm. about the kinds of, uh, of yeah. affinities that, yeah. and that can be forged, right, through the col a collaborative. In the, in, in the public sphere, i.e., in performance, in, in in readings, you know, I love to collaborate, and Nicole and I do a range of collaborations. Uh, um, I've, you know done some other collaborations, you know, as was mentioned earlier here in Albany with Ellen Sinopoli and uh, dance company. And I do like very much working with uh, musicians, you know, because it, it simply creates a wider, uh, uh, bigger, bigger area, bigger field. Uh, I was brought up short to that two years ago. Um, friends asked me to write an introduction to one of their uh, collaborative books. And so I had to begin thinking about collaboration. And I realized that I never liked writing poems with anybody else. I write my poems alone, but after that I can collaborate in many ways on, on, on them. So I know a lot of friends, you know, the New York poets were big collaborators and wrote, you know, you know even novels together. Uh, and that somehow never interested me, you know. Uh, the collaboration to me was always something that was more in the in the communal realm of, of other arts coming together with the writing art or other forms of literature such as an anthology. So when Jerome Rothenberg and I put together the Millennium, the millennium Anthologies, it does feel in fact as if we wrote them together because we think that the core invention of 20th century art, the one single distinct 
new technique of 20th century art is collage, as it is montage in, in, in film. It is the one newness. The rest we had all the way back to, to, you know, to more things. And so our anthologies are kind of a collaboration, a collaborative work based on collage of putting the best pieces together that we find, find around the world, right? Finding them. So it is a collaborative writing. But at home, in my little notebook, I write with my little fountain pen. Nobody can see it for a while, even not Nicole. <laughs> still hold on to that. It's I think this is true of all collaborations, but it seems like especially in yours, uh, I always see more than the sum of its parts. For instance, uh, reading Poems for the Millennium, I get a sense of how it's profoundly Rothenbergian, right, in, in, in the context of Rothenberg's, you know, uh, uh, older anthologies, but it's also profoundly Jerusian, right, in the context of your nomad poetics and the kind of questions that you're asking in your poetry and, 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 and translations. Uh, so, and, and the same way I think with your performances, I think there's the ways in which you know the tension generated by collaboration becomes it becomes its own right uh, aspect of, of of the poetic field. So, uh, uh, I wonder if, you, if that's something that you think about when you choose. Uh, what kind yeah. of collaborations to take on, right? Well, the kind of generative Jer potential yeah. of collaboration. Jerry and I have known each other since 1969. I was, when I, when I left Bard College with my BA, Robert Kelly gave me two phone numbers. One was Paul Blackburn and one was Jerome Rothenberg. And I called both. Uh, and Rothenberg became the Rothenbergs because I could always go there and Diane always had some food for a starving young poet, you know. And we would sit around with Jerry and talk poetry and, and, and so on. And then over the years, years later, after he did his first anthologies, and especially after he did America Prophecy, which by the way was reprinted recently a year or so ago and is one of the great books that, you know. Uh, I, he came to England, I was living in England that time, and I said to him, yeah, America Prophecy is okay, but prophecy is such a religious, I would like to do Europe a vision rather than America Prophecy, right? A different kind of a, a visionary poetics. Uh, we, you know, talked a bit about it. And a few years on, all of a sudden, we came up with an idea for another kind of uh, anthology, i.e. a global anthology. And to go into training, we decided to collaborate on shorter books. So we did the PPPPPPP referred to earlier, the performance, the, the Schwitter's book. Um, and what it turned out is that Jerry and I are simply extremely, how to say, easy to work with each other. He's very easy to work with and he must think that I'm easy to work with because, you know, we are totally non-conflictual. So, you know, the, 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 it, it was the easiest, the most wonderful way, you know, like, uh, uh, and I can imagine that with other people it wouldn't be that, you know. I know uh, a couple other projects I did, you know, that was not the way it worked. Uh, so there is also that, that simple fact of a complete deep friendship, you know, that makes you, uh, you have confidence, you know. If Jerry proposes something that's not exactly where I'm gonna go, I have the confidence that he knows what he's doing and that he is following a track that is interesting and totally, you know, accurate to something. And he'll give me the same leeway. So, you know, then the things come together. So it's very much also based on that kind of personal uh, exchange, that personal, you know, togetherness. Yeah. We have to say something about maybe the, the Tangur, uh, you know, the, the Millennium uh, Project as that developed, because that seems to be such a, a, a powerful part of those projects, mm -hmm. thinking of the 90s, I mean, of the uh, first two anthologies in the context of globalization. What does mm -hmm. it mean to do a global anthology, right, as globalization is happening? And then in the context, right, of global politics in the 21st century, right, to claim uh, the Maghreb, right, uh, uh, and, to, and to insert it into that mm -hmm. global matrix. They seem to me both kind of brilliant, you know, political interventions in the context of, 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 the, of the respective moments, so. The Maghreb had been on my mind for many, many years, as who was it uh, actually mentioned earlier, my, my roommate at Saint, at, uh, uh, in Paris, after dropping out, uh, turned out to be Mohamed Khairiddin, who became maybe the great uh, um, Moroccan poet of his generation. And so he, 
turned me on in those, in those couple months that we were roommates to Kateb Yassin, to a number of the Maghrebian writers. And it so then happened that 10 years later in 76, I got a job offer in London. I wanted to get out of London. It was getting too much. And the job offer was to teach at, at a university in Algeria. And I said, yeah, why not? Love to go to the Maghreb. Yeah, haven't been there. Let's go and check it out. So I went there, and one of the first people I met who was teaching, not in my department, but in uh, the uh, sociology department, was uh, uh, Habib Tongour. So we have known each other since 76. Became very good friends immediately between 76 and 79. Then he, m he wound up moving back to France, to Paris, and teaching there. I moved back to England, was a bit in Paris, then moved back here to, to the US. The anthology was in my head from the early days, from the, my days in Algeria on. Seeing that there was so much work that was completely unknown here or badly known in France and in France only used in very often politically nasty ways, i.e., you know, kind of post-colonial uh, uh, ways. Uh, one of the most famous of the uh, Maghrebi novelists is loved by the French who buy all his books and his writing is nearly, has become nearly unreadable to the Maghrebians because basically what happened was that he was told by his publisher that first novel is not bad but if you want to have success in France you got to write about this and this. And he did, made a brilliant career, right? So there was to me always a way, an interest in showing what actually was happening in the Maghreb because the literature seemed extremely strong. So I put, 20, for 25 years, I began putting things together and that book came. And then I thought, finally, when, I was, when Jerry and I were working on the other ones, now I may be able to get this project aboard. Now I need somebody aboard, you know, uh, uh, who, who, who can help, you know, and who knows more than I do in certain areas, in the Arab-speaking area. So Habib, the old friend, was there and I said, Habib, you want to do this book with me? He said, yeah, let's do it, you know. And again, it was a very easy relationship uh, to, to work this. We, of course, needed other people because neither he nor I knew any of the Berber languages, right? So you had to go elsewhere again to find people who, because the greatness of the Maghreb in a way is that it is a totally multilingual uh, country, you know. Uh, there are two great colonialisms, first Arab colonialism in the ninth century and then French colonialism exactly a thousand years later that laid themselves on top of the autochthonous peoples, you know, who were all Berber. Uh, so digging all that out and creating, um, I think, you know, what, what we both wanted to do was to show at one level a portrait of the richness of a culture that had been disappeared, as you know, I say. Uh, the only people you may know came from there if you brought up in the classical Western ways, St. Augustine, right? And he's basically known that he was born there, but really, really, you know, was this good Catholic in, uh, you know, living in, um, uh, in Rome, at north of Rome as a bishop, you know, and so on. You know, and maybe if you're, if you're, if you're a literary type, uh, you would have heard of that man who uh, wrote uh, a book called The Golden Ass, right? Kind of the first novel, you know. But, but that's it. For the rest, there was nothing there, you know. If you're a sociologist, you may have heard the name Ibn Khaldun because he's the father of sociology. Uh, but otherwise, the place was silenced to death, you know. And my vision of it was, was from very early on uh, that the fires were burning there and the pan in which that stuff was cooked, the meat was there. It was only the smoke that got to Europe at a time when Europe, Europeans were kind of, you know, uh, forest people living in huts and, you know, kind of, you know, not very cultured at all, you know. They'd already done really bad job uh, in terms of uh, the culture of Al-Andalus, Al which was that rich Arab culture in Spain for those years, you know, had, heading turned that back and so on. So it seemed to me very important, and of course this happens by chance, whatever, 
uh, at a moment when Arab countries, Arab culture and politics become extremely uh, visible negatively in this country, right? So in, in a way, I would certainly, to go back to your political thing, the anthology was also very strongly, in my mind, a political act to say, look, this is the culture we're talking about. We're not, you know, uh, Arab culture is not 250 uh, crazed uh, terrorists, you know. Uh, it, it has nothing to do. You know, that is something that happens everywhere. Look at the people who invaded this country once the Indians had found the guy who got lost on the way over, Columbus. Uh, you know, and what they did here, you know. Uh, so it was a question of bringing up, the, you know, enlarging the dialogue, hopefully. Okay. Uh, well, I definitely have to ask you a uh, Salon question. Uh, and uh, in terms of you, you want to address what you know, what brought you to Salon, what sustained you, but also my own sense. The first time I read Salon, I don't think I ever told you this, was in a really looking back now awful Spanish translation mm -hmm. that was kind of. I mean, again, maybe Spanish wasn't the best entry point. Uh, I, I now I now realize, right? But it was very uh, prosaic, right? Uh, and it somehow managed to erase the struggle that I see in Salon's writing, and I think your work seeks to, to document, right? Uh, the struggle with language, the struggle with meaning, right? Uh, the kind of philosophical uh, uh, aspect of his work. Uh, so I wonder if perhaps you want to talk about either Salon, uh, uh, what, um, what brought you to him, what sustained you, but also maybe what other translators got wrong. I mean, your translations are widely regarded as having allowed for a revision, right, of, of Salon's work, and I wonder if you could speak to maybe what, uh, what you saw in Salon that other, other translators maybe missed. Right. Well, I already said how Salon was what brought me to poetry, right? Sure. So he's been with me in that sense as, uh, in poetry, to be a poet, you kind of apprenticeship in an old way to a poet, in a way, that is, there's somebody you study to a great extent, and that study often is translation, because that is, as I said earlier, what you, what you learned from. My good friend Clayton Eshelman did that with Cesar Vallejo, you know, and he was also an example for that kind of engagement with one, with one poet. And translating Ceylon, reading other translations of Ceylon, but also of other, of other poets, studying translation, uh, Eshelman in his early magazine Caterpillar used to have a thing called a test of translation where he got somebody to compare several translations, you know, and, and uh, uh, say something about it. Uh, uh, what became relatively clear to me relatively fast was that if a poem read better, i.e. more easily, more elegantly in English, then in its original, it was a bad translation. That was the proof that it was a wrong, tr that the translation that's was the, off. That's was what wrong. I was trying to get at with the you struggle, know, the sense that you know, what I was reading in Spanish uh, had been yeah. desiccated beyond any kind uh, of tension. You know, there are some, I'm not even gonna, you know, mention names or so, there's one version of Ceylon that is done in exactly that way, you know. So, by the way, it's not published bilingually, uh, because that would be too obvious then if you saw the poem next to it, because each poem has a new form given, it is all over the place, it is whatever, you know, it's a kind of recreation. The one time I was in the same room thinking of those things with Robert Lowell at University of Essex, uh, we got into a, a, a kind of um, quarrel because I was suggesting, I was only a grad student, so I did it very gently, but I was suggesting that, you know, what he called imitations, which, I mean, he called it imitations, that already trying to get away from calling it translation to be, you know, so he, he couldn't be called on doing bad translations, or just <laughs> imitations, you know. And if you look at those things, he takes great poems, Baudelaire, Rimbaud, and their visionary poems, and he turns them into a Boston Brahim's uh, basic neurosis, you know? <laughs> They're completely down from vision into light neurosis, you know? And drinking problems, whatever, <laughs> you know? Uh, when metaphysics become drinking problems, you know you have gone a step down. <laughs> and so that he didn't like, and then somebody said that I was at that moment translating um, Charles Olson into French, and so he shot back as a kind of answer and said, oh, that should be easy. He only wrote prose anyway. 
And that's when the two English dons came and said, time for sherry, and ushered us, <laughs> ushered us into different rooms. And we never saw each other again, right? <laughs> so, that, you know, uh, yes, does that make sense? Oh, that's, <laughs> perfect. that's perfect. I mean, I, I want to get back to your, to your poetry a, a little bit and maybe to some of, some of the insight that was offered during the panel. I mean, the sense that your poetry really uh, complicates, right, existing uh, right, uh, uh, attempts to frame, right, post-war U.S. poetry. You have, you know, the new American poetry and your work certainly is in conversation with that poetry throughout, right? Uh, um, but your work is also uh, about, uh, you know, ha has its own nomad commitments, right? And I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, the evolution of your poetry from these, these, early, uh, these early role models uh, towards a space, I think, where it becomes uh, um, its own its own critical space, right? So I'm looking at the at, at your poetry mm -hmm. also as a as a as a critical attempt to remap a lot of the, the questions that uh, the people you were reading were asking about about breath, about about the page, about meaning, right? About uh, crossing, right? Uh, and if you see the, how how that's evolved in your in your in your poetry and maybe where your poetry is now also. So Ooh, I hope I don't know. I hope poetry. I don't know where my poetry is now. <laughs> otherwise, I'm in deep doo doo. That was a talk show question. Yeah, right. Your poetry <laughs> now, Pierre yeah. But on, on the process, uh, a bit indeed. I mean, early on, as as Robert said, I came to America, you know, and it was really the poetry of the beats, that energy, and not just Ginsburg and so on. One of the first ones that I read diligently and with great love was Bob Kaufman the one African-American who's always written out of the beat canon, right? And, you know, who should be there, who is central, you know, up till today. And I've been a uh, kind of defendant of, uh, you know, uh, trying to get Kaufman into the limelight again because he's as good as Corso, as a lyrical poet, you know. He has as much satire as, 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 as Ginsburg. Uh, so those were, those were the models. And of course, when, you, when you're very young and you're learning the language, you, know, you, you try to imitate, you try to find things that, that, that you can write and see how you can utter. Actually, I started out writing Japanese poems in English because I had so little English, but I had four volumes of blight on haikus. <laughs> so I wrote haikus in English because that was a way my, my, my relatively limited uh, so the, the poem that will open my collected poems one day will be Autumn leaves on clear rocks in a double scotch. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the Japanese form is already Americanized by the liquid. And tra <laughs> transcultural, right? Already there, immediately. Uh, after that, I came to, uh, when I was at Bard, the second day I was there, Robert Kelly's first wife, Joby, came in and said, you're a young poet from France who arrived. I said, no, I'm from Luxembourg. <laughs> and she said, okay, now, you have to know wh who you have to read. You have to read Robert Creeley, Robert Duncan, Robert Kelly. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, tous les Roberts. <laughs> in French, les Roberts are the teats. All the teeths of American poetry, all the Roberts, Roberts, the Bobs, the Boobs of American poetry, they all called that. But then he al she also said Charles Olson. And so that opened all of a sudden. I had a, I had a pensum, and Duncan came to read on campus a month later, and I didn't understand it at all. I thought this was totally weird. I know, I won't tell the whole story, Nicole, don't worry. <laughs> so. I came into that, into that material, and began to, 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 to try to digest that, m move on. At the same time, I was reading the European, you know, I was reading uh, Ceylon, and was coming across the Latin American poets, given that I had enough Spanish to be able to, 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 to read a bit. This got all very, in, if you want, in, came into one match, and I was trying to write still Ginsbergian poem, and I went to England. I moved to England from New York in 72. And I began uh, in London. I began writing myself into some kind of clarity. 
uh, trying to synthesize all those various influences. Clearly, the American ones were the, were, were the biggest one. But I was very lucky because at that moment, a number of young English poets from my generation, primarily among them, I want to mention them, is Alan Fisher, were doing exactly the same thing. We're beginning to invent the new poetics, drawing on the Americans, you know, and seeing if their Euro heritage had anything to give them. And with Alan, in fact, uh, a notion that we took very much, and I'm coming very specifically to something you, you mentioned. Don't worry, I'm not lost. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what we got from Olson was the notion of process, that a poem is not a procedure that you fill in, unless you're Jackson McLeod and you take that to the complete hilt, right? You do something, you know. Uh, but that process was the very important thing in poetry, uh, that you wrote out of whatever the processes were. They can be proprioceptive, i.e. out of the bodily uh, 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 modes out of uh, bring in uh, your reading, the events of the day. You know, the poem happens however it happens, but the, you, what you do as a poet, you keep writing it, you keep using the information, and then you find a way to organize that information. Now, what made such poems, however, often difficult for readers, especially if, like Alan and me, you were not only interested in your emotional uh, uh, stuff so that you weren't writing, con you didn't want to write confessional poems, you know, about your love life. Usually about the bad part, because the good part you can't really write much about. Uh, it's the bad part that writes easy. Uh, but we were bringing in intellectual materials all over the place. Uh, we, we thought that it would be important that the poem incorporate in some way something we came to uh, call process showing. That is, that the poem incorporated a handle by which the reader could see, ah, this is how it is composed, or this tells me, you know, a kind of programmatic element in, in the poem that allowed you maybe a way to understand how the poem was put together and incorporating that into it. And that was, you know, in, in a way, it's out of those things that, that my work then uh, emerged. And those years in London, were very fruitful because uh, I was basically unemployable for the English, except I would teach English language and literature at American Air Force bases, <laughs> <laughs> which was great because it gave you access to the shop and you could get big jars of bourbon <laughs> and great steaks for very little money. So that was, you know, the, it was really a great way of functioning drive there one day, teach, and have all the food and booze you needed for the week. And then you could sit at home and just work, uh, write, without the pressure of having, you know, either Europe or America, you know, you were in the narrow land, the England, you know. Um, and at that moment, it was really a wonderful place for a few years to do, to expand to be expansive and to invent, you know. And there were a couple of very important people said Alan Fisher, like Eric Mottram, who is one of the most knowledgeable cultural uh, critics, you know, who as a friend, uh, you know, every week we'd have an evening at Eric Mottram's house who played us all 20th century avant-garde music to Alan and me. Every Saturday my house was an open house and poetry readings were happening and people were coming and we'd cook, you know, and on Sunday, you'd have half a dozen corpses still around for breakfast, you know, uh, and the discussion went on and on. You know, it was it was an, an extremely rich and enriching moment in uh, for the poetic. So it comes out of that. As I go on, I used to write, as again Kelly very accurately said, I'm no somebody said I'm a morning person, uh, and I get up and write. That that became the habit. Uh, get up, sit down, write. But then all the poems became obards. I think it was Bell who said something about your bard, right? And uh, uh, so that became kind of, oh well, maybe repetitive. Nicole noticed it and said, uh, is that another one of those back porch poems? You know, I'd go out <laughs> for Medicine Place, which play in the house that we had that many of you know, I'd go on the back porch in the morning with a cup of coffee, sit there and start poem. 
Of course, sunrise and so on were always in it. But we always chopped that off, right? But uh, <laughs> so on. But there came to be a genre. And so I thought, well, let me try to find other processual ways of writing, but that are not simply in, in that flow that is becoming repetitive. And so I invented the genre for myself that I called the canto diurno, that is the poem of one day, where I take a period of 24 hours, and everything that I write during that time makes up the poem of that, makes up the poem, right? And I may put that poem together six months or a year later, but it is the writing of 24 hours. And sometimes I think about consciously writing, the notes I take from my reading, all of that, you know, becomes a form. Or it can even be a kind of still late beat poet. I, dr I took one day where I drove from Albany to Worcester uh, to go to Jack Kerouac's grave. And so I wrote a poem, huh? Oh, to Lowell. I wish so, yeah. To Lowell uh, and went to Kerouac's grave and wrote a poem uh, every time I stopped uh, along the highway. Uh, and that became, you know, one of those cantodionos. So I always find different ways. There's a sequence now that was also referred to based on the letters of the Arabic alphabet, an alif ba, right? So each of the letters will give me a reason to write a poem by. Or the last book that came out, I drew when America invaded uh, Baghdad, and from my love of Arabic literature, Baghdad was, of course, one of those amazing places, you know, uh, one of the most cultured places ever. But we're the only place where they pay translators very well. In the 12th century, a translator was paid in the weight of gold, the weight of the manuscript he translated, he got in gold as payment for the translation. Hey, paradise of translators <laughs> there. So when America invaded, this was, you know, besides the very fact that the war was so completely awful and totally wrong and, uh, and off the cuff, I thought I'd do, I, you know, wanted to write towards that. And so I found that there was this, this uh, poet, visionary Sufi I knew of, or I'd read some of, I'd read his biography 20 years earlier, called Mansur al-Halash. And I was then quickly looking for Monsieur al halaj material on the web because I didn't have those books uh, uh, anymore. Uh, and I found a list of 40 English terms saying al halaj teaching, one to 40, and each one was a word. And I said, okay, I'll use those terms and make of them the titles of 40 poems that I'll write towards, you know, Monsieur Al-Halaj, thinking with him, thinking through him, thinking about the war, right? And that took, first they came very quickly, and you know, uh, it was Chris Rizzo who I saw recently, earlier, where is he? Uh, there he is, who published the first 21 of those here in Albany, and then it had to go slower, and they had to get longer, because the war kept going on and on. So I finally wrote to 40 years when supposedly the last troops left two years ago, and that book came out this, this spring. So there's an other way, you know, ways of finding uh, reasons. And um, so then the processual procedures, or procedures that lead to processual writing. So, you know, to, to think of those two words. Does That's that great. tell you? That's terrific. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, we, we may be uh, nearing the end of the conversation, but, but you, you, you emphasize uh, both community and sharing your process, and I wonder if you could address that in the context of your role as a teacher. I mean, thinking of, uh, of you know, why we're here uh, today also. Uh, there's so many people say writing can't be taught, right? And you mentioned how, for example, translation becomes for you also an entry point, right, into, into the poem as something that you share with your students. So could you speak either to your teaching practice, right, or your sense of mm -hmm. how teaching operates within the framework of, of community and, and, and of this expanded field of poetics that you've spent so many years exploring? Well, maybe the, uh, the elephant in the room would be that short line in the interview in The Time is Useless. Uh, uh, that circulated a lot on the web these days, which, uh, where I am asked, uh, where in the world can you find good poetry today? And my very glib, but I thought of it twice and I did it however, answer was everywhere except maybe in creative writing classes. <laughs> 
in that sense, what, I, my, what, what, what I liked in my teaching, and I tried to avoid create pure creative writing teaching to a great extent, when I did it, I always did it via translation. One, because that is the way that I knew how to uh, approach reading a poem and learning from a poem and maybe learning tricks as a poet how to go about writing, right? And uh, so therefore I thought that translation was the best way you could teach somebody writing. Uh, I prefer to teach literature courses. I'm, you know, if you want, academically I'm a comparatist. That's my doctorate, right? Uh, naturally, I'm a comparatist, given the, the, the cultural measure. So my great treat was putting together courses that, in the English department, in which there was not a single English author, right? Uh, Arab authors, French, whatever, and African authors. I told a lot of, you know, African literature, Maghrebi literature, uh, or things that would not be so much considered literature per se, a philosophical text, or uh, travel diaries, you know, uh, things of that order. Cultural studies seemed to me what was most important for my students was to get an idea that the culture is way wider than what they, they're exposed to, right? Uh, that the culture is also more multi-layered, that is, music counts too, you know, and if you want to really look at modernism, it is not sufficient to say uh, study uh, Dubliners and a bit of pound, but you have to study the music of the turn of the century, right? Uh, you, have to, you have to look at architecture, uh, you have to look at the scientists of that, of that moment, you know. Uh, so, what interested me in terms of that was again just making a mess of things and bringing everything in and saying, here it is all. You have to sort it out. I'm not going to sort it out, by the way, for you. I'm just giving it to you and you, you know, it's like plate things. You, you construct the animal you want and need. I'm just giving you as much as possible different toys, different Lego pieces, you know, that don't fit into one type of construct so that you actually have to whittle them to make them fit. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I think it's a great place to end. Let's end with toys. Why not? That's a good thing. Thank you.